Okay, um, welcome to um, tonight's SOA Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, lecture. Uh, tonight is the, uh, uh, the latest uh, lecture in our um, Contemporary Taiwan Indigenous Peoples uh, lecture series that's sponsored by uh, the Shui um, Museum in, uh, in Taiwan. And what we try and do in this um, uh, lecture series is highlight uh, a range of topics from different academic disciplines that look at issues related to Taiwan's um, indigenous uh, peoples. We've, we've had um, talks on uh, political science, on anthropology, on religion, and uh, today we look at the topic of Taiwan's indigenous people and uh, environmental uh, politics. And our speaker today um, is Professor Wang Tijie from um, at Changrong uh, Christian University in uh, in uh, in Tainan, in southern uh, uh, Taiwan. So he's just uh, arrived at at, or at Changrong. Is that right? Um, um, previously, he'd, he'd um, been at National Taiwan uh, University on a number of postdoctoral uh, projects. Um, I first met Professor uh, Wang back in uh, 2008 when I was his um, PhD examiner. Uh, and uh, I'm quite well known for being a, uh, a horrible examiner. In other words, I tend to be uh, very, very tough, and I, and I tend to give people two vibers and, the, and 18 months, or a, uh, a, uh, the kindest normally I give is, is one year revision plus a, plus a second um, uh, viva. Um, so, um, uh, usually I'm quite, uh, I'm quite nervous about facing people I've examined before because I know what a tough time um, I, I give them. But um, Professor Wang is one of the exceptions. Um, uh, he's one of the very few people who I gave uh, minor revisions uh, to. Um, so this, um, if, if, I, if I say that the other person who I gave minor revisions to uh, was John Sullivan, um, you can get um, you can get some idea about how highly uh, I rated uh, Professor Wang's uh, work. So um, uh, he was also one of the first uh, PhDs I ever examined. I think um, maybe a couple of years after I um, I came to so so he he did his PhD um, at King's College in uh, the geography department, and he had a fascinating problem. Oh, a fascinating um, <laughs> um, project uh, that looked at um, the linkage between uh, environmental politics and Taiwan's uh, indigenous uh, people. Particularly, he particularly focused on a national park um, uh, project in the uh, Chantribian uh, era. So, it was, so when we were thinking about uh, who to uh, bring to SOAS to look at um, environmental politics and Taiwan's indigenous people. He was one of the uh, the, the first names um, on our list, and so we're really delighted that he was able to find the time um, in his busy schedule to come back to um, uh, to London to share his um, his research. And to a certain extent, um, uh, this paper today has given him a chance to actually revisit uh, his uh, earlier studies and try and update. Um, um, uh, his earlier work. And I think this is your first SOAS talk, is that right? Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. So, uh, um, it's, we'd like to um, uh, welcome you to, um, to uh, SOAS. So hopefully there'll be, um, well, um, he'll be back tomorrow for his uh, second uh, environmental politics. Friday. No, Thursday. Uh, uh, Friday is Liang uh, Wenqing. Okay, so let's give uh, Professor uh, Wang a very big um, uh, SOAS welcome. Well, <coughs> thank you, David. Um, it's always good to be back um, in London. Uh, well, as you, just ha as you have just heard, my name is uh, Wang Dingjie. I, am, I will be joining Chang'an University, the International College for of um, Practice and educa Education for the Environment, it's a long name, ISP, uh, at Chang'an University uh, from uh, February. Now, today I'm going to talk about indigenous peoples and the politics of the, of the environment in Taiwan. Now, to be honest, I really can, cannot claim to be an expert on indigenous affairs because 
uh, I mainly from the environmental side, and I, uh, but in my uh, uh, projects uh, since uh, <coughs> 2016, I've worked and interviewed. Uh, I've interviewed and worked with indigenous groups uh, on the eastern coast. So I sort of know, you know, their perspectives and their problems. And, and writing this paper really gave me a um, uh, helps me to, as David said, yeah, helps me to revive my um, <coughs> interest in this re uh, the relations between indigenous peoples and environmental politics in Taiwan. So uh, for today's um, presentation, I will first give you a very short introduction about the core uh, problems of the research. And then I will discuss the, the impacts of colonialism on, the, on indigenous human environment uh, interactions in Taiwan. I will mainly focus on Japan's colonial period. And then I will discuss the economic development uh, and cases of environmental injustice in the um, post-war era. And then I will um, talk about the um, democratization uh, process and indigenous indigenous activism and vandalism since the late um, 80s. And I will conclude with some uh, recent developments and case studies. Well, well I, I gave a lot of pictures, so there was, yeah. um, The first, when we think about indigenous peoples so, and the environment, when these two things come together, what, what would come to your mind? If you're familiar with the literature on environmental politics, um, <clears throat> you would understand that oftentimes, from the environmental perspectives, the environmentalists often think that indigenous people are in harmony with nature. They're closer to nature than we are. We are well, sort of the moderns. And they are, you know, either because of their hmm, ways of living or proximity to natural environment and so on. So it is often assumed that indigenous people are in harmony with nature. But I think that kind that kind of notion should be contested. And uh, because it really sort of misunderstands the indigenous situations today. And on the other hand, environmentalists and um, indigenous peoples can form alliance. As you can see on the uh, pictures on the left, uh, these were the um, <coughs> any, any, uh, sorry, sorry, Native American tribes who united uh, against, uh, uh, in protest against um, pipeline projects in North Dakota. Now, as I will des describe in, uh, in my lecture later, they Environmentalists would form um, alliance with um, indigenous activists, but they can also have, actually very often have um, um, lots of tension between them. Uh, for example, on the pictures on the right, you will see, it, it reads in Chinese that the Ch indigenous basic law, based on that law, you should return to our people our right to hunt in national parks in Taiwan. So that's one of the source of the tension between environmentalists and indigenous groups in Taiwan. But not just on that island, but also in other countries as well, in Africa, in North America too. So the first thing I would like to highlight is that the relationships uh, between indigenous people and environmental um, groups can take multiple forms. So the second uh, theoretical focus would be uh, in what ways uh, have colonial and post-war political uh, developments affect indigenous human environmental interactions in Taiwan and how do indigenous people respond? Uh, this is especially important uh, in the, um, when we look at the, the Japanese period because um, during that time, uh, indigenous people are not as being made into political agents of environmental politics as today. So I think the focus will be, will be more on how colonial legacy, uh, how colonial ways of uh, uh, governance have changed indigenous lifestyle and so on. And well, a short introduction to Taiwan. 
since we are here uh, at the center of um, Taiwan studies, so I think I should help to popularize the case for studying Taiwan, especially regarding indigenous affairs. The first thing is that uh, Taiwan has a very distinctive colonial history compared to uh, North America, Australia, or Africa. It is colonized by the only non-Western uh, colonial powers, namely Japan, which was the main um, uh, colonizer, uh, sorry, um, the modernizer of the um, Taiwan island. And the second um, reason would be Taiwan has diverse landscape and indigenous cultures. As you can see, on the western part, it's mainly plains, flat areas. But from north to south in the central areas, it's mostly mountain. So mountainous areas are actually half of the land mass. It's very forbidding because Taiwan has the highest peak, mountainous peak, in East Asia, namely Yushan. So you can imagine it's... It, if you go to the mountains, it's just high and very forbidding for Han people who may not be so skilled in uh, forest life, but also for administrators as well. For either for the uh, Qing dynasty or Japanese, too, anyway. Uh, indigenous cultures, well, they have more links to other Austronesian peoples and languages across the Pacific rather than Han Chinese culture. And uh, Taiwan actually were popularized before the arrival of Han people. They were popularized. Uh, the, um, um, they were populated by uh, plains and highland Aborigines. And uh, it's very much unlike today when you sp speak of the highland. When you speak of indigenous people in Taiwan, you only think of the highland tribes. Actually, prior to that, um, the plains areas were full of uh, indigenous. Not full of just. I mean, they inhabited there too. So, uh, yeah, Taiwan has, um, since political liberalization, um, there has been strong environmental indigenous activism. And also, interestingly, even though Taiwan has been ousted from the United Nations, the island has tried to keep up with progress in international human rights regimes. So, well, so as to showcase that, well, it can exercise sovereignty against the People's Republic of China's claim over Taiwan. Okay. So, well, a short history of the convoluted, well, regime change uh, in the past. Now, prior to the Dutch rule in uh, early 17th century, uh, there was no, or oh, hardly no, uh, real political regimes on the island. So the Dutch colonial rule, well, along with the Spanish, were probably um, the first um, political regimes on the island, when then followed by uh, the, uh, the family of Kosinga, uh, or Kosinye, who expelled the Dutch in 1662. But the island was uh, taken over by the Qin, uh, China uh, in uh, 1683 until the um, until late uh, 19th century. And um, Japan took over after the um, first um, Sino-Japanese War. And the Kuomintang um, <coughs> government of the Republic of China took over again uh, after 1945, at the conclusion of the uh, Second World War. And then there was a single-party authoritarian rule since 1990, 1945 until um, around the late 80s, when um, the lift of martial law and political democratization Followed. Right. Well, prior to uh, Japanese, uh, it was a, it was kind of a, um, how would you characterize it? Um, a kind of frontier society. Here, in Taiwan, you have uh, a lot. You, you can, you can, they can be categorized into three groups: Han, Han settlers, um, cooked savages, meaning indigenous people living on the plains, and uh, cooked meaning being more civilized, and raw savages living beyond the border, as you see here, uh, in the white area. Uh, now the Qing, 
China will call them raw savages. So on the plains, uh, uh, on the plains, um, the society was more or less uh, the <coughs> uh, a kind of uh, Han dominated society uh, that emerged with, with a hybridized culture because of uh, inter ethnic interactions, intermarriage, and uh, assimilation or synthesization of uh, plains of aborigines. Now, rogue savages remain on text and ungoverned, uh, living beyond the borders, uh, which is, we just you know, highlighted in that area. So, effectively, the Qing China does not have sovereignty beyond the borders there. And that means really high mountains. Now, since the uh, second half of the 19th century, international competition and conflicts intensified, uh, resulting in the um, uh, for example, the um, Danshe incident, uh, by uh, which gave, uh, uh, in which the uh, some Okinawa sailors were killed by indigenous people in the south of the island, and so that gave Japanese an excuse to invade Taiwan. So Japan got very interested in acquiring Taiwan. Now I will discuss that later, but. Right now, I would, I would like to emphasize that indigenous culture change and adaptation is a crucial um, aspect in the uh, <coughs> cultural interactions here. Because some environmentalists would love to think that indigenous people you know, live in, their, in a very isolated situation. Whereas in actual fact, they, um, they have been interacting with the Dutch, with Qing China officials, and with Han settlers all along. So they have, been, they have partial exposure to modern trade and technology. They do camphor trade as well, which was a uh, lucrative trade uh, in the later half of the 19th century. They have a lot of guns. So they have, they have, um, they have accumulated lots of guns, and they can be very powerful militia. And that's why when in 1894, when Taiwan was being ceded to Japan, uh, you, you see, the, uh, the ungoverned areas is around there. Uh, in after ten years, or more than ten years, Japanese still cannot effectively govern the central mountains. So, well, here's a uh, map uh, produced in the early 20th century when the Japanese rule, when the Japanese conducted the uh, uh, mapping and safaris. Just to give you an idea that the plains aborigines they live on the world, on the plains, but it, it, because nowadays we te when we look at Taiwan we tend to think that you know it's all high society, but prior previous to that, prior to that uh, the plains of aborigines dwelled uh, from north to south, from west to east, and from the plains to the highlands, the mountains. Okay, so Japanese colonial rule. Well, Japanese had a, a lot of um, modernizing projects for Taiwan, uh, including having full sovereignty over the island, unlike the Qing, China. So it used, uh, well, as I would describe, military uh, attacks and so on. But on the other hand, it also conducted scientific surveys, population survey and maps, which the Qing uh, didn't do very well. <coughs> Uh, until the end of its rule. And it has a lot of urban planning and infrastructure projects and agricultural and industrial development and, for, and modern forestry as well. But first priority for Japan was to quell um, armed Han resistance. And then after that, uh, they would look at the um, headhunting rogue savages in the mountains. They call it the fun or the management of savages. So the administration, well, taken scientific way approach. Uh, they begin by uh, doing initial surveys and mapping of Taiwan, its geography and its society, especially regarding the highlands. So as you see from those pictures, those are the old pictures from the Japanese conquest of the highlands. And this is, this is one of the ceremonies, the, the, the photo of the ceremonies uh, celebrating the surrender of one of the indigenous tribes. <coughs> 
So between 1902 and 1915, the Japanese colonial administration launched military campaigns and strict measures to gain control over indige highly indigenous tribes. And the goal was twofold. First is to subjugate and manage uh, well, the so-called savages. And second, um, to develop the forests and conduct resource extraction, camphor, forestry, minerals, agriculture, and so on. So what did, what did Japan used to do? Well, <coughs> first they, they proclaimed uh, state ownership of lands and forests. Uh, for forests that have uh, no, uh, for, for lands that have no documents or land deeds or any document showing previous ownership, that will be state lands. And that will include most of the forests in Taiwan because the raw savages being untaxed and ungoverned, they don't have the, the documents to show that, that, they were, that they own those lands. And they are very different from settled agricultural groups like Han uh, people. So and the Japanese also uh, installed a series of guidelines and police posts to supervise and uh, dis to discipline the indigenous peoples. And they conduct uh, punitive military expeditions. For example, the um, Kenfo Wars against Ataya and Sidik tribes in the north. And it, it, um, the Japanese also conducted Taroko Wars for a very bloody um, military attacks on the um, Turuku people in 1914 uh, using around um, 20, I think 2200, 2200 uh, sorry using something like uh, 20,000 uh, soldiers against 2,000 Turuku people who almost got, got wiped out in that, uh, in that war and then to manage the um, well the indigenous peoples, they for, the Japanese forced um, them to resettle in flatlands or foothills near to police posts, uh, sometimes mixing different tribes or family lines so as to, to break the power structure in them. And um, there, were, there were also other civilizing and assimilative programs, for example, education and language use, uh, develop infrastructure well, <coughs> of roads and railways and so on banning in appropriate indigenous customs and uh, asking them to adopt agricultural practices. And finally, the uh, Kominka movement since um, um, during the uh, Second World War. Okay. Um, one one pe peculiar thing about the Japanese rule is that um, it really decisively shaped the indigenous people their relations, their lifestyle, afterwards, and it produced irrevocable alterations of bonds between indigenous peoples and their lands, which is um, really crucial to really their cultural revival today. So, for example, um, as I mentioned, um, they have um, lost their ancestral lands to the state, and the Japanese state encouraged. Uh, state and, and private enterprises into the forest uh, to ex extract resources such as camphor and timber um, uh, to satisfy domestic what well, meaning Taiwan demand in Taiwan and sometimes um, to profit from international trade and forced relocation and adoption of agricultural production. And also, indigenous peoples were forcefully asked to refrain from subsistence economy and join uh, capitalistic production and trade. And for example, uh, they would be asked; they would become auxiliary um, to the camphor trade. And prior to that, they were doing tra camphor trade with Han Chinese, so they were kind of like uh, profiting for themselves. But after the Japanese came in, uh, well, the lands become state-owned instead of um, belonging to the tribes, and um, yeah. so um, I guess you can say that um, the most important aspect is that the, um, the Japanese uh, broke the bounds uh, between uh, indigenous peoples and their lands.
and that have uh, repercussions in the post-war period as well. But I think it's really important that, especially if you have, um, if you have uh, looked at other literature in Taiwan studies, you you will know that Japanese colonial legacy is a very complex issue. I mean, from the presentation above, you may you may feel that it's kind of like the indigenous people were the victims of Japanese rule, but the the reality was much more complex, because the Komika movement, which to make Taiwanese people imperial subjects of Japan, especially regarding uh, indigenous people who were secondary citizens previously. Now they would they have a chance to become the imperial regular normal subjects of Japan. Now during that time, that was kind of an honor. So a lot of, a lot of indigenous peoples were proud that they could speak Japanese very well. And they have very fond memories of Japan. I remember seeing one of Zhou Wan Yao, a Taiwanese historian. Her, when she interviewed a, um, in a, a tribal elder, and when she talk, tried to talk about Jap his Japanese experience, and the <coughs> elder would stand up and begin to sing Japanese anthem. So the Japanese legacy is a very complex one. <coughs> also because the post-war experience initially wasn't that, wasn't that great. So, well, a quick review of the developments after World War II. Well, since 1945, the Republic of China gained control of Taiwan as during <coughs> Japan's, after Japan's uh, defeat in World War II. But in 1949, uh, Kuomintang of the Republic of China, or the Nas Chinese Nationalist Party, lost Maryland to China and fled to Taiwan. And since then, uh, the KMT authoritarian regime was installed until uh, the martial law in 1987. <coughs> and as you're probably aware, Taiwan was one of the four tigers, and the, its economy uh, grew rapidly since the 1970s. Well, political pressures uh, erupted in the um, late uh, 80s, and in the 1990s, after the lift of martial law, democratization began and the, um, the nativist politics intensified. Uh, by that, I mean the, a, a, a kind of Taiwan-centered uh, identity politics at the time, in contrast to the China-centered uh, uh, viewpoints or uh, worldviews imposed by the um, KMT regime. And this resulted in the first democratic transition of power in the 2000 presidential election, in which the uh, Chen Shui-bian of the DPP won. Well, after the war, the, the KMT authoritarian rule um, was as harsh, was equally harsh, not just to Han people, but also to uh, indigenous leaders too. So for many indigenous peoples, the KMT's governance was reminiscent or even an extension of the Japanese rule doesn't change really that much. Because from the indigenous pers perspective, you are all, you know, like foreign powers, foreign regimes coming into Taiwan, taking my lands, taking my lands from me, from us. So from an indigenous per perspective, that doesn't really change much. So the, the KMT uh, adopted um, sinicization measures and strict control of mountainous areas because they were very afraid that the communist bandits would hide in the mountains. And um, yeah, political suppression and white terror, which um, the KMT during that time was very famous for. And for example, they have, um, the KMT have killed Gao Yishen and Tang Shouren, uh, two of the indigenous leaders uh, were executed uh, in the 50s. Well, as Scott Simon suggested that um, you can see, we probably can see the um, indigenous people as the underside of economic miracle in Taiwan. They have not really profited from the economic boom since the 70s. One of the crucial uh, reasons was that loss of ancestral lands continued. The KMT government had no intention to re return those lands to indigenous peoples because 
state, it considered itself to have inherited uh, the land ownership from the Japanese colonial state. So, any use or taking of forest produce by indigenous people was considered theft. And uh, since 1968, the Kennedy government began <coughs> to designate Aboriginal reserve, uh, reserve land or reservation land. But uh, it's a very tricky law. It, it, it was intended to protect the, Abor the indigenous communities. But actually, if you are an indigenous person and you wanted to register those lands under your name, you have to have evidence of uh, having conducted agriculture for 10 years, which many normal indi many indigenous people don't have that, just don't have that kind of experience because they are not agricultural set, uh, groups. That was not their uh, customs. So it created difficulties for indigenous people, but uh, on the other hand, the Han people can lease for, by whatever means. They, they could lease, try to lease um, those, um, tra <coughs> uh, those uh, reserved lands uh, lands reserved for indigenous people and um, try to develop. So the result is now on these lands you often see Han business. Employing indigenous pe people paying very low wages today. So it's a very, um, well, but well, that was then anyway. And uh, the Camp Eugene also. Um, <coughs> adopted the uh, involuntary relocation of uh, indigenous settlements because control of indigenous groups was uh, of utmost importance. So some of the uh, tribes were moved to even lower uh, altitude. And yet again, uh, as with Japanese times, indigenous people were uh, encouraged to grow cash crops instead of uh, uh, subsistence economy. Uh, this, sounds, this may sound good, but actually the uh, the environmental conditions in the mountains may not be that good for agricultural uh, uh, production. So that may be, that wasn't such a great policy from an environmental perspective. So in any way, um, <coughs> many cases of environmental injustice uh, followed. Uh, we'll discuss this uh, here, uh, showing the, um, well, the case of hybrid deforestation uh, between 1954 uh, and 1972. Uh, these were the, I think the the trucks or the forestry crew uh, hired by the Veterans Affairs Council. Uh, the Veterans Affairs Council, at the time, was trying to find because when the KMT relocated to Taiwan, they brought a lot of soldiers, veterans, and the KMT government have to had to, you know, you know, create jobs for them. Otherwise, there's going to be rebellion. So one way was to exploit Taiwan's abundant um, forest uh, resources in the mountains. So one scholar, Chen Guodong, of the uh, academic uh, Sinica, he gave an estimate uh, during the so-called hybrid deforestation period, about two years, within two years of during this period, the affected areas logged by uh, the Veterans Affairs uh, Council would equal the total area of forestry affected by the Japanese during the, the Japanese times. So only two years would equal the, Japan, the whole Japanese period. So you can imagine that was huge first, huge foreign exchange earned by these products. And second, of course, um, the forestry, uh, the, the hyper uh, deforestation period resulted in very strong environmental movements afterwards because Taiwanese society um, <clears throat> looked at this period and thought, um, you know, this is, this is proper theft. If, how can you call indigenous people um, trying to take something from their own land, theft, and when you look at this compared to this? So, well, other cases of environmental injustice, for example, may include Asia uh, Cement's quarry mining in Hualien, uh, which is, is located 
on the eastern side of the island. Asia Cement is owned by a very powerful businessman, Xu Xu Dong in Taiwan. Uh, the boss of the Yandong Group, a very, very powerful man. And the, the company acquired land in 1973 through very dubious means. Uh, for example, by duping the, um, the indigenous people who have the land deeds to sign their names on a paper uh, without specifying the, uh, the details and so on. So it's, it's a huge controversy right now since 2016. And, uh, because the Asia Cement tried to um, renew their mining license and the Ministry of um, Economic Affairs granted the renewal and of course very vigorous protest emerged uh, against the, the decision and I'm, I myself personally am I'm, I'm now being asked to do a social impact assessment on the renewal but uh, uh, it's a very, very controversial case uh, because it, part of the quarry is located in a national park. And as I, I will describe later, in national parks, you will not do such things. Yeah. And moreover, the site was very close. I think it's just somewhere around here, about several hundred meters, very close to Turuku settlements. So, because, as you can see, it's in the mountain. It's not in a plain, in a flat land area. In the mountain, it's quite dangerous. And they can expand the area so they dig deep. Deeper and deeper so they use explosive devices. So, when the explosion uh, takes place, indigenous communities would feel the repercussion. So that was serious um, impacts on their life. But Asia Cement has all sorts of um, reasons or arguments. For example, it uh, contributed significantly to Taiwan's economy and so on. And <coughs> so they got a uh, renewal of their money license. And the indigenous people have been protested this since the 70s. Didn't stand a chance against this very powerful businessman. Well, national parks. National parks in Taiwan has been a very important environmental institution, protecting biodiversity and uh, the natural environment in the mountains. Uh, the national park law was enacted in 1972, <coughs> which largely borrowed from the United States. So <coughs> since 1984, uh, the government began to set up uh, national parks in the mountains. The problem with the model is that in the United States, in the United States, the national park movement was very much based on this notion of wilderness, of an untouched environment, pure, pristine, just there that shouldn't be intervened or or received uh, human impacts. So it used a kind of very exclusionary. Um, uh, measures to to well, protect the environment while ignoring the historical indigenous activities on those lands. Now, that was that that of course received protests from um, Native Americans, but also in Africa, where such models uh, were implied were imposed. Um, that would result in huge conflicts between park administration and people who have used those protected areas, not for generations, but maybe for centuries. Now, under the national park law in Taiwan, indigenous peoples are strictly prohibited from hunting. They cannot conduct hunting, gathering plants, growing crops, and so on. But, is the what, what they call the general or regulated areas, you can conduct scientific research, you can build commercial facilities, 
you have to receive tourists, of course. Usually owned by Han people. So you would, you would understand the indigenous anger at the national parks. To them, this is a very, you know, this is the, uh, the precisely this is the, the idea of theft from their eyes. In the name of the environment. So you can see why I mentioned earlier that there may be strong, very, uh, a lot of tension between environmentalists and indigenous groups. So uh, three of the national parks, Yushan and Sheba and, Ta and Taloko, national parks uh, have um, lands that are overlapping with the aboriginal reservation lands or traditional territories claimed by Budong, Ataya, and Tuluku peoples. Now, these days, uh, I think it, after the year 2000, when the Taiwanese politics got more receptive towards indigenous demands, um, among the groups and indigenous activists have been asking for co-management, borrowing from Australian models. Uh, so, on the right you see, I think this is a very recent um, happening that indigenous people asking for the computization of effective co-management <coughs> schemes and changes to the national park law. The problem is not just that changing the, in, uh, the national park law is very difficult in Taiwan because environmental groups would absolutely oppose that idea. It wants the national park to be untouched, remain untouched, however and whatever. But also because if you want to be part of the employees in national parks, you have to become part of the bureaucratic system. You have to pass certain exams. But um, it's very difficult for indigenous tribes to pass those exams because, well, it's just not their strengths. Put it, let's put it that way. So you're putting people who don't really know about indigenous people in those places in indigenous in national parks, while ignoring people who may have good in-depth knowledge of the environment there, running the national park administration. So well. There are many practical difficulties in trying to implement reforms. Well, finally, um, the, the nuclear waste storage facility, um, the Oki Island, or Lan Yu. The, um, the storage facility, as you see uh, on the upper right, is built by Thai Power, the former state um, power company in Taiwan. And uh, well, the island is just off call, oh, the an island offshore, uh, offshore island in the um, south east of Taiwan. And it was built in 1982. Uh, the Thai power just went in and started building. They didn't really consult the Yami or Tao people. There, whether you want to receive this nuclear waste or not, who were not told the consequences of. Um, the risks of nuclear uh, waste storage. So, yeah, the Lanyu people have protested ever since and until now. And sadly, just in last year's election, the issue was being abused by pro-nuclear groups, as you know, in those online forums and social media. You can make all sorts of arguments. They would say, you know, the Tao people have um, received all this money from Thai power company and why does they have been so ungrateful they wouldn't want to have this uh, storage place uh, in their homeland and um, yeah those languages will remind you the old KMT or Japanese days but we should ask in the first place why we need to put the nuclear west outside of Taiwan, putting on an island uh, with population around 3,000 people and trying to tell them that it's not, it's just harmless to put it there. It's really a 
a lot of uh, irony here. So that was 1991, an old photo, and that was just after the lift of martial law when uh, politics was still very tense. And just not, well, the next photo is in, uh, taken in 2013, showing the um, tribal elders wearing their traditional helmets. Making protests, asking the um, nuclear waste <coughs> to, be, to be moved out uh, from Orkey Island. And they are still uh, do, making the protests year after year in various ways. Well, anyway, since the 1980s, the, um, the, polit the politics began to democratize and civil activism uh, emerged. Well, a few developments here. Uh, first, the formation of the nativist oriented Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, in 1986, who had a better relations with, with indigenous activists. <coughs> and the lift of martial law in 1987, followed by political reforms. In the 1990s onwards, uh, there has been very strong civil activism. First, universal direction, uh, sorry, First universal direct election of the president of ROC at the Republic of China uh, <clears throat> took place in 1996, and first peaceful democratic power transition in the year 2000. And I should mention that environmental and indigenous activism have a love-hate relationship with the DPP, as you saw on the upper right. That was a, I think that was in the early 1990s when Chen Dinan of the DPP <coughs> um, opposed a, uh, a development project. And uh, also, the indigenous uh, politics was a very important um, element in the nativist uh, uh, politics in Taiwan because when the DPP and um, now so-called Pan Blue forces try to articulate a Taiwan-centered identity, uh, they would include indigenous people as a justification that well the island does not belong to China because indigenous people were the real, the original owners or masters of the Taiwanese island. Uh, aside from domestic reforms, there also was uh, influence of international legal regimes. Taiwan tried to keep up with the um, progress in international legal regimes or, or um, United Nations directives. Even it's not one of the members of the UN because they are the ones to use such cases as exercise of sovereignty, trying to refute People's Republic of China's claim over Taiwan's international status. And NGOs also use uh, such progress, trying to pressurize the government, especially uh, in the field of wildlife conservation and human rights and indigenous rights. For example, indigenous rights uh, the domestic movement was already very strong since the 1980s. There had been name rectification movement, so the indigenous people asking the government, instead of calling them uh, mountainous compatriots, they should be called indigenous peoples, which was in line with the indigenous move, international indigenous movement. Uh, 19, since 19, uh, seven, sorry, 1987, uh, there had been indigenous self-rule movement and anti-nuclear waste movement from uh, Lain. And since uh, late 80s, uh, return and lands movement, which culminated in the uh, traditional territory mapping and uh, recent declarations, official declarations. Uh, uh, around 1999, before Chen Shui-bian of the DPP uh, became president, Chen Shui-bian signed a new partnership between indigenous people and the new government, specifying that, that for example, uh, the new government should be elected 
he, he will implement many um, demands uh, from indigenous people concerning lands, the retaining of lands, and uh, <coughs> self-rule, and so on. But as you know, well, Chen shui bing got uh, was strong resistance in the uh, Congress, so it was very basically very difficult. But anyway, the DPP was more receptive to uh, to, um, to indigenous demands anyway. So the on um, Chen shui bings second term, um, the government issued the Indigenous People's Basic Law, which was a very important milestone in Taiwan. And in 2016. President Tsai Ing-wen of the DPP offered an official po apology to indigenous peoples. And the, um, <coughs> her government also paid stock um, the uh, traditional territory um, mapping and uh, designation afterwards. For example, in 2017, the government issued guidelines for the designation of indigenous peoples' lands for tribal areas, which indigenous activists would consider crucial to their um, cultural uh, revival. Now, in Taiwan, indigenous groups and environmental NGOs can collaborate on certain topics. As I mentioned, anti-nuclear issue, issues on large nu nuclear waste, for example, and the preservation of old growth forests, which were in the interest of both parties. <coughs> And other on sustainable planning and development projects, for example, the mining site I just showed you. But there are many other issues that environmental NGOs feel less important or simply opposed. For example, the indig indigenous right to development. There were environmental groups are really not keen to hear about um, this agenda. And um, other issues like hunting in national parks and protected areas which was opposed not only by environmental groups, but also by Buddhist organizations. The goals of self-rule, well, the environmental NGOs have no ears for that, because it's mainly from the environmental perspective, they don't really think, well, in the hands of indigenous people, how would I know they would ensure that they will have the environment uh, properly protected? Because, like any other groups, on the island, they have an interest in development. So you see, these environmental groups and, and indigenous NGOs may, may just have small overlap, and sometimes they may be pulled in different directions. Now here I will use indigenous right to hunt as an example. The hunting is central to Taiwan's indigenous cultures, but their right to hunt has been uh, restricted by Wildlife Conservation Act, the regulation governing permission and range, management of guns, ammunition, knives, and weapons, a very low-grade uh, statute, but huge consequences if you want to have a gun, if you want to own a gun. And as I said, indigenous people have been using guns since who knows when, not just recently. So they, use, they have used guns to hunt. As almost like they're part of their tradition. So they don't use arrows, mind you. But indigenous don't want to hear that. They would imagine, well, they should hunt. Well, not with guns, because that would be what happens if that is combined with commercial hunting. But <coughs> uh, many scholars have shown that you know, indigenous people, they don't do that anymore, because the demand, the market demand is so low now these days for rare uh, animals, mountain animals. And third is the national park law, which I mentioned uh, was very difficult to change. And luckily, since the uh, year 2004, uh, there have been amendments to Wildlife Conservation Act that uh, allows indigenous people to own guns, to conduct, uh, sorry, to conduct um, hunting, uh, in protected areas for ritual purposes. The problem being, this amendment was very much ignorant of how indigenous people hunt. They would ask indigen indigenous hunters to make registration of how many you are going to hunt for your ritual purpose, while, whereas 
indigenous hunter take cues from dreams, for example, from what their ancestors tell them through whatever means. They wouldn't do prior registration. Okay? So, in effect, even with that amendment, indigenous hunters don't do a registration, they just go hunting. And the government knows that. So it's a kind of very bureaucratic mindset against a very you know, practical people who just want to be left alone, doing their own business. Well, this picture shows uh, quite a few tribes united together, <coughs> uh, making a bonfire, releasing the signal to hunt, in protest against uh, the many arrests until recently. Many arrests, uh, indigenous, indigenous hunters were arrested uh, because they either own guns in, pro in, proper, <coughs> in proper ways or because they conducted hunting. But right now, the, um, I think the highest court have ruled that indigenous hunters are allowed to hunt uh, for their cultural needs. And so there may be ease of regulation, uh, the, reg the regulations may be eased uh, in the near future. And scholars have um, argued that with proper monitoring mechanisms in place, indigenous hunting uh, practices and knowledge would be very important in wildlife uh, management in Taiwan. So instead of very instead of a uh, very centralized mode of wildlife management like national parks, you can divide uh, the protected areas into several hunting grounds and let indigenous people, you know, using their traditional knowledge and hunting knowledge to give an estimate and to regulate the species number and so on. But there was still a long way to go because legal reforms needed are needed to reflect changing, changing perception of indigenous hunting. And um, environmental NGOs had been reluctant to increase um, their willingness to um, work with indigenous people. So that's a, there's a lot of change. And uh, okay, well, we, we, I just go quick. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Now, finally, the issue uh, is regarding indigenous traditional, traditional territories. The the basic law stipulates that in development projects ought to go through conservation process, but in, in practice, uh, there was very few um, such appointment. Uh, for example, uh, the um, the famous Samu Lake, which uh, was the uh, actually the traditional territories of the Shaozhu Shao people, and there was a project just last year that was located on the uh, ancestral lands. And I went through the environmental impact assessment, but did not consult the shop people for their consent against the basic law. So vocal opposition ensued and resulted in the EPA's withdrawal of the IA conclusion. And that was the beautiful site of the project, which was where the shop people's ancestral spirit rest. So you can see, it's a very stupid decision if the, if the Nanto county government wants to develop a big hotel there. But just this month, the Rich Township office successfully made administrative reappeal against the um, declaration of the Council of Indigenous Peoples regarding the South People's traditional territories. Basically, it's being invalidated. So here I quote, not because I approve it, but to show you that the kind of um, discriminatory uh, mindset that Han people usually have. The um, Nanto County Magistrate, Mr. Li Mingshen, said that, is it right to let Shao people, which has a population of mere 290 people, restrict or determine the activities of local and central governments, especially the Yushu County, the uh, Yushu Township, which has, I don't know, 15, 19, sorry, about around 20,000 
people, Han people. So should we like, let a small number of indigenous people to, de to determine how we develop the, the area? So the case highlights practical difficulties and confusions concerning indigenous traditional territories and the need for environmental NGOs because they have received uh, little support from other, environment, in other national environmental NGOs, I think. Yeah, who really should further engage with the indigenous activists. But this is, I would, I would suggest, this is not just about Yuzhi Township. It's, if you look at the Taiwan, and, and indeed across the globe, as a whole, indigenous, indigenous people are truly um, a minority in this sense. So how to ensure their rights would be a very difficult um, task indeed. Now, I've made a few suggestions regarding how to improve indigenous environmental relations in Taiwan. First is that it is desirable uh, for environmental groups and in society in general as well to deepen their understanding of indigenous issues, cultures, and history, forming a stronger basis for collaborative work. And second is that the, the central government really need to take steps to clarify how to implement indigenous people's basic law, especially regarding free, um, free prior and informed consent of indigenous communities. Because no one is doing this right now, because people don't know how to do it, or when to do it. And, and I will talk that, about that tomorrow, anyways, during the, <coughs> about the environmental impact assessment. Now, changes in legal and bureaucratic frameworks and monitoring arrangements are needed to achieve sustainable wildlife management with indigenous support, which is very important if we want uh, harmonious ethnic uh, relations in the highlands. Now finally, I would suggest that we should move beyond the dichotomy between economy and environment. This may sound quite academic or abstract, but I think it's a very important paradigmatic change. If we try to think of, if we try to search for pathways towards sustainable social development for all, not just for the Han people, as we as you just saw in the Yishu uh, Township case, then you would take indigenous concerns seriously and asking how development projects can be planned uh, prior to uh, implementation uh, that will be more uh, sensitive to indigenous culture and needs. Um, with these reflections, I conclude my uh, presentation today. I hope that that will be helpful to you. Thank you. That was uh, fantastic, Tinji. Um, um, you covered a huge amount of, um, of uh, ground there with policy suggestions, historical review, and some fascinating um, uh, case studies, some of them which we uh, are quite familiar to us and others. Um, so, um, I've got a lot of questions, but let me just limit myself just to um, um, to one. I was curious whether you could comment a little bit about uh, the role of indigenous elected politicians um, in um, in this relationship between um, indigenous people and the environment. Because thinking back uh, to your PhD dissertation, I seem to remember that um, one of the key characters. Uh, in your study on the National Park case that you looked at was uh, Gaudin Sume, who is quite a well-known uh, indigenous um, uh, legislator, and she played a key role there. Um, uh, to what extent, uh, and if we think about Taiwan's population, th uh, the proportion of indigenous legislators is higher than uh, the total population, so we have uh, six indigenous legislators. Yeah. Uh, while the total indigenous population is 2%. Yeah. Um, um, do they really represent indigenous interests in, on these uh, issues? Well, I will begin with the final, the last question. Should they really represent the indigenous interests? Well, does MPs in the UK really represent the interests of the people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, we all have our own strange, convoluted politics. But, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a good thing that you mentioned Gao Jing Sumei. She was a um, 
She was a very, very peculiar character. A very strong woman, but also a very um, uh, persistent um, China-centered mm -hmm. indigenous politician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, I can say it's a very, um, it, it's not that straightforward, because traditionally, indigenous electorate tended to support the KMT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the KMT is much more pro development. Okay. And very often ignoring indigenous interests. So I ask you again, does M do MPs really represent British people's interests? Mm. Yeah. So but I think in recent years I can see I can mention two trends, for example. Indigenous well that that would that that has happened since Kaojin, since I think that was after Chen Shui Bian got elected. Oppositional party can use all sorts of issues, indigenous included, to, to rile, to, to blame the government, the ruling party. Yeah. Doesn't mean they really care about the indigenous interest. Sometimes they just use this occasion. Uh, I think this is too personal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> personal observation, mm -hmm. you know. But I think Gaojin, people would criticize her for being a bit showy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that they take indigenous people to Japanese uh, shrine, uh, national shrine, asking the um, Japanese uh, ancestor to, to be removed from the shrine. But I think other politicians. Uh, within the DPP and KMT as well, in recent years, they have done hard work mm -hmm. yeah, concerning the indigenous basic law and traditional territories mapping. I think that uh, it's quite clear that um, some indigenous uh, politicians were more keen to reflect, to represent okay. indigenous interests, yeah, while others may use you know, issues to blame the ruling party and so on. Yeah. Okay, let's open up some questions. Who would like to uh, start? Yeah, Eva. Uh, well, I, I think. Hold on. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking as a raw Scot. Um, I have never been cooked by British imperialism. Mm -hmm. So uh, the issues that you raise, uh, like, or, the, or the indigenous um, situation in Taiwan uh, raise, uh, the, the domination by external power, the um, the loss of disposition of land, the loss of language, obviously resonate uh, with me, uh, but they also resonate uh, around the world. Um, uh, two weeks ago in the French paper Le Monde, um, there was a two-page article, and it really was two pages of writing, no large photographs, um, about the Penang, um, who are a group of, um, an indigenous group in, on the island of Borneo, Borneo. Um, 80% of their forest has been taken, has been logged, um, a lot of it illegally, um, and um, uh, at the present time they are, uh, they have um, a barricade um, which they are manning uh, to prevent um, further um, uh, deforestation. Um, of course, it's part of Malaysia, which is in much more um, authoritarian regime than. than presently in Taiwan. Um, usually the police are sent in uh, to physically um, take down such um, uh, barricades. This time um, that hasn't been done uh, because there's been a change of governor in, 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 in the area. Uh, apparently, and he's taking a, a more um, <laughs> a responsible view, I, I, I would say. Um, um, so anyway, um, these issues don't just exist in, in Taiwan. But um, I, 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 I want to ask, ask questions. This is something that I, I can't um, resolve myself. Um, uh, Pythagoras um, said that um, uh, uh, one day killing an animal will be seen in the same way as killing a human being. And Leonardo da Vinci said as, as long as men kill animals, they will kill each other. Um, I, I um, have a great respect for indigenous uh, uh, cultures. Um, uh, I'm very uh, supportive of them and, and the idea of 
self-determination and self-sufficiency is also I also strongly advocate. Um, but um, uh, increasingly in, in the 21st century, um, it is becoming recognised that that uh, animals do have uh, skills, sensibilities, um, uh, intelligences, and, and, and emotions. Um, so I find it hard to reconcile that that. Um, uh, hunting is, is um, uh, you know, uh, and I wonder just not part of culture to be protected. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the question is about hunting. Please help me so, reconcile um, mm -hmm. my position on all this. And, and I, I presume that is probably one of the reasons why the environmental groups are so uncomfortable with this idea about uh, legalizing uh, hunting. Yeah. Um, and especially the Buddhist groups. Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, B, were you going to... Yes, of course. Yes. Can I? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. And, um, thank you very much because this is really a fascinating topic. Um, I was struck by what you said uh, when you talk about uh, the Japanese period, that um, the bond between the indigenous peoples and, uh, and the land were broken. And now uh, I've... Uh, I'm really quite uh, struck by this fact that it's true. I really want to know a little bit more. Could you, um, for example, um, what's the condition now? How, how's the bond between uh, the, the two, you know, the people and the land? Um, and also, because, you know, the con all these from, from Japanese to the KMT or now, um, this the regimes have not done too much about, you know, to try to improve uh, or to amend this kind of broken bonds. So, um, but why it got stronger? At least I feel that the, the desire to build, rebuild this bond seemed to be stronger. Could you elaborate a little bit about this? Thank you. First, regarding hunting, I probably don't have a definite answer to your question, but I do believe in my um, reading of the indigenous um, literature and when they when I speak their thoughts, actually they agree with you. Animals have feelings, sensibilities, and so on. So, for them, it's not exactly immoral to kill them. And as you know, as you very well know, it's in the old days, it was due to survival, their subsistence economy. And so far as I know, as I suggested, that hunting was their, a crucial component in their culture. Because, for example, it's a, it's a kind of rite of passage. A boy has to become a hunter become, to be a man. And that is not going to be uh, that requirement is not going to be downgraded. Just put it that way. So if you in the if you're part of the indigenous tribe and you want to be a kind of a full male member, the the quickest way is to become an effective hunter. And also hunting would require a lot of ecological ecological knowledge about the area. So that's why. Actually, these hunters, they may know about more about or certain dimensions of the local ecology, more so than scientists, because they interact with animals, they have first contact with animals, and so on. So they really know the, the species condition. As for whether they should be prohibited from mm, hunting, that's a, that's a question I guess I cannot answer. And uh, all I can say is, as of now, well, a, the demand to legalize indigenous hunting is very strong in Taiwan, uh, with very vocal um, support from indigenous communities. And I think more people in Taiwan are acknowledging that indigenous hunting is not necessarily a bad thing. It was a bad thing. It was 
it was being viewed as a bad thing because, as I said, when the economy took off, the Han people, as you know, love to eat all sorts of things, like rare mountain animals. So they got those rare animals through indigenous hunters. So there was a kind of a market, a chain of production there. But these days, I think since the 80s, you know, in Taiwan, people now lay more emphasis on yang shen or well, your own physical well-being by eating, I don't know, less meat or whatever, yeah, being a vegetarian and so on. So the market demand went down these days. So indigenous hunting came back to their, <clears throat> like their, uh, the level prior to that market boom for uh, rare mountain animals. So that amount is not that much, to be honest. And it can be, as I said, some other scholars have argued that it's actually a way to regulate, to control species number. So it isn't that such a bad thing. Plus, we're talking about an island where death penalty is still legal. So, anyways. Now, second, concerning the, um, uh, the bond between indigenous lands and, and the, between <coughs> indigenous people and their lands. I hope I, I have conveyed uh, well that um, <coughs> to, uh, I should also mention actually when we talk about indigenous people, the plains in indigenous people, the cooked ones, were more or less invisible here. Mm. Yeah, because they sort of became part of the Han Chinese, the general, the, the broader Han Chinese later on. But they remain uh, indigenous as well. Now the the bond. So when we talk about that, we're probably talking about Highland tribes, okay. Now as I said, I think this proclamation, this imposition of state ownership, probably is the most um, um, crucial in breaking off the the, the bond. As to the revival of of such bond. I would suggest that, I think maybe Professor Gondo wants to talk about this. We need to, the Han society really need to have a better understanding about what traditional territories means. It doesn't mean, we, tend, we have tended to land, see land in, in the light of ownership, property rights. So, Han people were very afraid that once they are declared traditional territories, so no more development will be allowed, and so on and so forth. But from my experience talking to uh, indigenous uh, groups, they very often emphasize that first, development projects ought to be more sensitive to indigenous culture. You shouldn't build a hotel uh, where the ancestral graves on the location of their ancestral graves. So, for example, that, well, that's one example. And um, so if you can, if the Han society have a better understanding of what traditional territories means, and have less fear about it, and more tolerant of indigenous cultural activities. And uh, it's actually, I wouldn't say the bond is totally broken, it's just like altered, altered, because their mode of production and their locations were very often, uh, their settlements were very often relocated. So that wasn't easy for indigenous tribes, but as I said, they, they adapt, and sometimes their culture changed as well. I think the, the question right now is that, they wanted to use their traditional territories uh, as hunting grounds and other cultural uh, practices. Now, probably that isn't a, a complete acceptance of traditional territories by Han society. Probably isn't very easy, as I just shown. But I think in, over the years, 
we have seen much progress. Let's, I can, let, let me put it that way. We have seen much progress since the 1990s when the return my lands movement erupted. So maybe we'll see more conflicts, but also more progress in the next few years. We hope. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks very much. That was an excellent talk. Um, I, my question is, um, is about indigenous language education. So, um, well, it's UNESCO Year of uh, Indigenous Languages this year. So, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of um, language education in um, indigenous um, politics particularly in reference to environmental politics? Okay. Well, I must admit, I'm not an expert on that. But, well, speaking of language, it's actually interesting, because I just read in my, when I studied the subject for the chapter, you know the Japanese policemen, they would learn indigenous language in order to communicate with them, of course, to discipline them. But the KMT, during the KMT period, authoritarian period, uh, they tried to suppress the language, eradicate, well, not just indigenous, indigenous but native Taiwanese language as well. So, so yes, uh, indigenous language uh, revival is uh, very important, and, and not just for indigenous people too, but for other like Hakka groups. Uh, it's very difficult, and um, well, I think um, one of the issues is that it's it's very difficult to create words, letters for the indigenous language, and I know some people have been doing that, um, but um, it's not that easy. Even for Hakka language <coughs> or Kaja language. Uh, it's already very difficult. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm, my knowledge about indigenous language education isn't very great. But I can say, you uh, But I, 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 uh, I could add that we, we have had a, uh, a talk on that topic of indigenous language uh, education. I th oh, is that video live yet? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Okay. Um, but it's, it should be pr pretty soon. Actually, and the one who did our indigenous language education talk is a uh, recent SOAS uh, PhD right. graduate. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we've got the chapter for that one, though. Yeah. So that one is... Um, the other um, talk where that topic came up was when we had a session on um, indigenous media mm -hmm. and, and some of the mm -hmm. challenges there. In other words, what language do you use in indigenous um, uh, TV? Because you have so many different um, yeah, yeah. Uh, languages, and of course you have differences in terms of the uh, the size of of um, uh, groups, with some pretty huge ones, and some where actually the number of native speakers is 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 almost uh, kind of disappearing. Um, I think because of time, uh, we should continue our discussion over some um, uh, wine. And the other thing to say, of course, is that Professor Wang will be back. Uh, same time tomorrow in the same location, but uh, still talking about environmental politics, but without that uh, indigenous. Well, there'll be some indigenous yeah, well, uh, coverage yeah. um, uh, there. Um, but until tomorrow, let's uh, give them another uh, round of applause.